welcome to History Now. As we're in election season, I thought it might be a good idea to look back on previous elections on the island. And joining me today to talk about this is Dr. Martin O'Donoghue from University of Limerick and Dr. Elaine Callan from Carlow College, St. Patrick's. You're both very welcome. So Elaine, uh, your work is on election propaganda and we've had a, um, a, a program before about the 1918 election, but we didn't look at it so much as the propaganda around that. Can you give us a sense of how much was propaganda a factor in successes and, you know, failures in that election? Well, it was actually crucial um, for a number of different reasons. Um, starting with unionists, even they had to prolong their message of um, persuading their followers to vote uh, in favour of the Act of Union. Um, and they were drawing on new messages in order to do that because this election, of course, was happening at the end of the Great War. Uh, so they could use the war and they could use Ulster's contribution in the war to reinforce that message and that message of empire. Um, Sinn Féin were trying to introduce something completely new. Um, their ideas were abstention from Westminster and appealing to the Paris Peace Conference as opposed to the Imperial Parliament. But not only that, they had to introduce a whole host of new candidates that people hadn't seen before as well. So that message had to get out. And the Irish Parliamentary Party, uh, well, their message was in many ways stale because it was still the home rule message, but it had been interrupted uh, quite substantially by the Great War. Um, and they still had to sell that idea to the public out there. And Labour was coming into the fray for 1918 as well. They did opt out of the election or withdraw from the election at the end. But uh, they still had a very good message uh, of appealing to that working element um, of the Irish population and that had to be sold as well. So you were in an era of intense competition um, for, for all of the elections in the revolutionary era and they all had to propagandise their message. Arthur Griffith founded Sinn Féin in 1905. Did they play on that name recognition at all in the propaganda? No, uh, not as much as you might think because the party had evolved a little bit um, since 1905. Uh, it, like it started off as a small monarchical party. Uh, Arthur Griffith um, still saw the King and or Queen of England as the overarching ruler, if you like. But by the time you move on into uh, post-1916 era, uh, that had completely changed um, and they were seeking complete independence. Now, if you look at Sinn Féin propaganda during that time, they're not really quite sure what form of independence they're looking for, except that they know they want independence. Sometimes they're talking about a republic, sometimes they're simply talking about independence. So they're working their way through, uh, finding their feet um, in terms of what they're going to become. But they really solidify that um, as they come into the 1918 general election. Um, they solidify themselves in terms of structure, um, and they emulate a lot of what has gone before it in terms of the Irish party. Um, they copy um, what has gone on, on in the past. So, uh, but their message is different. It's a new nationalist message that they're bringing um, to the Irish people. In an era of complete change across, uh, across Europe, particularly after the Great War. I mean, you enter the Great War with kings and princes and queens, and we exit with presidents and prime ministers. So there's rampant change, and of course then as well into that comes the 1917 Russian Revolution, which is bringing the idea of communism to the fore as well, and that's been absorbed into this kind of new Sinn Féin message as well that they're trying to sell. So they're appealing quite broadly, but um, at the same time they're leaving out uh, certain elements. They're never going to convince the unionist population into their programme. It's too radical. And we can see that even in the results of elections like the 1918 general election and even as we move into the local elections in some areas of uh, Northern Ireland, what's going to become Northern Ireland, that uh, you know, voters stay safe um, and stay with the Irish Parliamentary Party because they're talking home rule. That's still keeping a link, uh, whereas Sinn Féin's departure is far more radical. Martin, just on that point, Elian talked about change, but you also talked about keeping a link with the past. You've written an article for RTE Brainstorm. You talk about in it the different parties that branch off. In using the names that they do, you argued in it that you know, there's a, a benefit to keeping name recognition to the revolutionary era. Would you say that's a form of propaganda in itself? 
And could you give us a couple of examples of the parties you were talking about? Yes, I think it is a form of propaganda in itself. Um, I don't think a party is necessarily going to stand or fall merely on its name. Other matters are important too. But I think if you look at, say, the free, in free state politics, there is an obvious tendency for parties to be named um, after titles with, well, let's say, the, Harry, the Irish language, or that draw on, let's say, whether this is Sinn Féin, whether it's his antecedent coming in Wales, which then is the name taken by the pro-treaty group and the, and the government of the Free State, and indeed Fianna Fáil itself, or the Soldiers of Destiny, the, the name of de Valera's new party when he breaks from Sinn Féin in 1926. It, again, that can be hearkened back to the Irish Volunteer Uniform of 1916. So these kind of catch cries and labels and names are often used and reused. And it's quite interesting, I think, that Elaine mentioned the sense to which the Home Rule is a catch cry, seen stale by 1918. And in fact, there is this sense to which the Irish party in 1918 even realises that in the sense to which they're talking about dominion home rule, which is still somewhat unclear in, term, in legal terms, but in terms of their propaganda in 1918, they're talking about dominion home rule as something that represents some kind of an advance on the previous legislation that they were so proud to champion prior to the outbreak of war. So then, after 1918, and you get these other parties coming up, and they're taking on these names. So again, pro-treaty Sinn Féin becomes Cumann na Gael, hearkening back to the old Griffith movement, and that has an obvious cachet. And then you also have Fianna Fáil then taking that name. But something that I've looked at in terms of not just the Irish party, but the legacy of the Irish party, and where Irish party leaders, politicians and supporters go, is the sense to which that for some people, the catch cries and the slogans of the Irish parliamentary party still have a, a big appeal as well. So you have a, um, the kind of persistent support that Elaine has touched on already. So this is representative in terms of the kind of what's often called old nationalists. And they find their way into the Nationalist Party in Northern Ireland. And it's part of a, a kind of a riven nationalism in the Northeast in the 20s with um, those from Sinn Féin backgrounds. But then in the Free State too, you have the remnants of those and depending on the appellations you use of certain independent nationalists in 1918, you have about 220,000 votes for approximately for the Irish Parliamentary Party in 1918. So in, in Southern Ireland as well, you have former Home Rule supporters, former Home Rule politicians, and they appear from the election of Alfie Byrne in the pact election in June 1922 as an independent in Dublin, and perhaps most significantly then John Redmond's son, Captain William Redmond, who's elected for Waterford in 1923. And some of these, not Byrne significantly, but Redmond and others, form an Irish National League party in 1926. And the Irish National League, as a title, harkens back to Parnell's movement of the 1880s and represents then probably the clearest attempt to revive the Irish Parliamentary Party in the Free State, led by Captain Redmond, led by the former MP for West Kerry, Thomas O'Donnell. And they're using this name again. And one of the appeals of this is that it's a recognisable name for a party that's chiefly made up of those former Irish Parliamentary Party supporters, it makes sense to go back to Parnell. And they use and reuse Parnell and Redmond in their slogans in the 1927 elections. So if they're up against Fianna Fáil and the connotation that term has, come in a Labour as well is a, is a very simple um, and easy to remember name, obviously, for a left-wing party. The Irish National League seeks to set itself out as having this distinctive name. And there's all the more reason to do that when it comes to the 1927 elections in the Free State, because there's so many parties contest the June poll. Yeah. Um, Eliane, if I can go back to you, just drawing on sort of recent, the race, very recent past and elections, you, you know, you had, you know, the Brexit referendum in the UK. You got a lot of heightened sort of election campaigns, really, really, you know, extreme measures of getting, you know, a message across. When you had an election like that of 1918, how, how, what was the election propaganda like on the whole as compared to, say, a local election? Well, interestingly uh, that you mentioned Brexit, uh, a lot of the themes that existed in 1918 resurfaced again when Brexit was being discussed um, in terms of the idea of identity um, and belonging. Where did people belong? Do they belong with Britain? Do they belong with Europe? Uh, all of these kind of questions. But local elections are slightly different than, than I'm, I'm going to call them national elections, uh, regardless of where they are, but uh, because you're trying to appeal to a much, much wider 
audience um, in a national election and you're really trying to sell the high ideals of a party. So for example, the Irish Parliamentary Party were promoting Home Rule, Unionist Union, uh, Labour Labour and Sinn Féin abstention. Whereas when you get down to the local level, uh, things change slightly uh, because people are interested in the everyday issues, things that matter to them on an everyday level. So at local level, one of the key concerns, of course, is things like rates, uh, public amenities, roads, water, all the basic things that we need to live by. But these parties, when you go back in time to the likes of the 1920 local elections, they have to sell them in a way that fits with the higher ideal. So uh, Sinn Féin is talking about creating a republic um, that's going to be completely separate from the British Exchequer. So how is this republic then going to fund itself in order to pay pensions, um, in order to you know, uh, have all of the, the amenities that go on? And that's how they have to sell themselves at a local level. Um, and the same for the Irish Party and Home Rule, and the same for unionists um, during this time as well, who argue that, well, the link with Britain will keep um, all these services going at the rate that they're going at. So um, it gets a bit more nitty gritty at the local level, whereas at national level, it's the higher ideals and how all that's going to work. Yeah. In the, the 1920 election, which was another very important one, I don't know if it's going to be celebrated or commemorated as much as 1918 has been, but what state were the Irish Parliamentary Party in, in that local election? Yeah, the Irish Parliamentary Party are in a difficult state by 1920 because in 1918, it's interesting to note that in the constituencies that are contested in 1918, the percentage vote that the Irish Parliamentary Party get is roughly equivalent to what Fine Gael would have got at its electoral nadir in 1943 and 44, and indeed, the, let's say, the vote you would have seen first preference-wise from Fianna Fáil in 2011. Um, but yet the Irish Party really ceases to function after 1918 in anything like the fashion that it had done up until that point. And the number of reasons for that. Uh, first of all, the first past the post system ruthlessly punished the Irish Parliamentary Party in a sense that whereas proportional representation or another fo um, form would have seen them retain some more seats. You also have the age profile of the Irish Party, where primarily, with, f with a few notable exceptions, the Irish Party by 1918 is made up of Parnell's old veterans, they're parliamentary veterans, there hasn't been a general election since 1910. So at that point it is an ageing parliamentary cohort and they're reduced to just six seats in the island of Ireland and all of them are in Ulster apart from Captain Redmond surviving in Waterford City. So after 1918 then, there's movements among MPs and are what are often now ex-MPs that they'll reorganise forces. And John Dillon, who's lost his seat, losing heavily in, in Mayo to, to Eamon de Valera, is still the leader. And he's been consulted, and he's been consulted with Joe Devlin, who's held his seat in Belfast Falls, and other UIL, or United Irish League, the branch organisation of the Irish Party, around Ireland are looking to try to reorganise into 1919. But a lot of the MPs that have just been defeated are, as I said, they're, they're older. They're MPs that have held their seats for a very long time. Some of them have never actually had to fight elections like they did in 1918. They were unaccustomed to fighting elections. So in 1920, what you find is that in the more urban um, council elections of January 1920, nationalist candidates still do quite well. Um, I'll use the appellation nationalist, whether they were some nationalist councillors wouldn't always have been um, necessarily officers of the United Irish League, but they would have gone with the designation nationalist. So they still do quite well considering the fact that Sinn Féin are trying to put forward um, their message in 1920, nationalist candidates do quite well. It should be said, proportional representation is used in 1920, as opposed to in 1918, so it does benefit smaller parties. And there's an older electoral register than the one that was um, obviously used in 1918. But by June 1920, where you have local elections in more rural areas, the Irish party or nationalist candidates do fare rather badly. We're talking about in a, in a time period where, you know, mass media was confined in newspapers. Can you tell me what, you know, what methods they would have used to get their message across? Because were, were they severely restricted in, you know, their media uh, avenues? And did that make them more creative in what they did? 
they were more restricted when we look at the modern world today uh, and we look at television and radio and social media. But back in the day that they operated in, um, they used their specific method and means of communication. Um, the big one, of course, was public speaking, um, like going out into the world uh, and into constituencies and holding public meetings. And remember, these public meetings were very, very well attended. Um, people came out to them. It was a form of entertainment as well as a form of sourcing information. But imagine you're the lad at the back of that uh, public speaking. You're not catching everything that the candidate is saying. So where it really picks up is for political parties that they have to have that speech reported on in the local newspaper the next day. And local newspapers were good at reporting speeches. Um, so newspapers became quite crucial uh, to getting the message across um, at every level. And they also used advertising um, in, in many different ways, uh, as we use it today. A lot of classified ads in both the national newspapers and in the regional newspapers. Um, posters were big. And you mentioned uh, the Great War. The Great War was a watershed when it came to mass media communications. That's really where a lot of media communication was learned because they could see how people were motivated to enlist in a war where people were dying by the thousands. Um, and yet, you know, this kind of medium was working. So politics began to emulate great war media campaigns uh, and use them uh, on the domestic level. And canvassing, we still see it today, that was used very well. And nitty gritty things like postcards, uh, we don't see that today because they don't exist, but people would actually have messages on postcards that they would send around by post to various different people. But there was also a couple of novel methods used because, uh, you know, putting an ad in a newspaper is quite expensive. Um, and when you get down to local elections, uh, the budgets are much smaller. Um, and we see uh, instances uh, in the, the by-election in North West Common is a great one in 1917, where it, the weather was really bad, uh, very bad snow, and it was dubbed the white election actually because of the weather conditions. And they actually used the snow uh, to write messages in it. So across the snow, there was messages of up plunket. And uh, Sinn Féin's father, Michael O'Flanagan, came across an entire poem um, in favour of um, Jasper Tully um, up in that area and satirising the Irish parties written into the snow as well. So there's a couple of instances of using walls, gable ends of houses, um, paint uh, to paint the colours on the gable ends of houses um, of the particular political parties and slogans written up on uh, street signs and things like that. So there's quite novel methods yeah. used too. Martin, if we can go back to you, um, you mentioned uh, the Irish Parliamentary Party post 19. 18 election. Mm -hmm. If you can go back to when they were sort of at their height, what methods did they use? And they were a political machine, you know. Absolutely what, a political machine, yeah. yeah. So in, what, what, in some ways, the, the first big political machine, or certainly the first big nationalist political machine. Um, obviously, they took from the, the constitutional nationalist tradition. But whereas they differed from parties before, is that they're organised into this party machine, this pledge bound party under Parno. And they managed to form a party that's also a national movement, really. And Parnell instituted strict discipline in Parliament, but they also had a tremendous organisational machine around the country. And this is something, I suppose, that's been taken up by, say, Dave Fitzpatrick's line, that they managed to vampirise organisations. So rather than what we might understand a modern political party to have a constituency branch structure, where every little, every little branch is part of the wider organisation, the Irish party had a few organisations. They would have a principal organisations that often came from the land war period. So I mentioned the Irish National League of Parnell, the 1880s earlier. And from then the turn of the 20th century, you have the United Irish League as an agrarian organisation. And that's the closest thing they have to a constituency branch organisation. But they also draw very strongly on the Catholic fraternal body, the Ancient Order of Hibernians. And in Ulster in particular, that's actually stronger because there was a sense to which the UIL wasn't as strong in Ulster because the land issue wasn't as salient. And when Joe Devlin emerges, and he's the youngest of the leadership cohort in the Irish Parliamentary Party, Devlin is senior in the UIL, but he recognises the, the potential, really, of the Interest of Hibernians as an auxiliary body for the Irish Parliamentary Party. And it's reorganised in the 1900s by him and by John Dillon Nugent from Keedy in County Armagh. And that becomes kind of the, the second big stem of the Irish Party's grassroots organisation. In many areas, 
they ha they're not used to fighting competitive elections. The Irish party is used to fighting competitive elections against the unionist party in areas where unionist support is strong. But in areas where there isn't strong unionist support, they might face a Sinn Féin challenge. But Sinn Féin is quite small outside of local government level in Dublin. Um, in many areas up until the First World War. They might fight a breakaway organisation. So William O'Brien and Tim Healy um, have tempestuous relationships with Irish party leadership and William O'Brien finds the All for Ireland League, but that's strongest really in Cork and in the province of Munster generally. So there's these parts of the country that before 1918, the Irish party has just had untouched supremacy. You mentioned um, William O'Brien, mm. now his newspaper, The Irish People. He was a great propagandist mm. in his own right. Were there any other people like that who were associated with the Irish Parliamentary Party who could turn their hand to you know, that sort of really potent um, propaganda? It'd be difficult to say, I think, that there'd be anyone quite as talented as O'Brien. And O'Brien was really a jewel in the crown of Parnell's um, organisation and machine at the height of Parnell's leadership. And O'Brien is quite important, I think, as well, in terms of framing criticisms of the Irish party. So I think O'Brien is quite important, along with some in Sinn Féin, at um, framing accusations of jobbery at the Irish Parliamentary Party. So if you think of Sinn Féin at local council level in Dublin talking about itself as the anti-corruption party, O'Brien is very strong too in claiming that the Irish party is guilty of jobbery. He's very strong in framing criticisms of the ancient order of Hibernians as well because O'Brien's eventual departure, his final departure, if you like, from the Irish Parliamentary Party comes after a convention um, dubbed the Batten Convention, where he argues that he, that he and his supporters are attacked and pushed out of the Irish Party effectively by Ancient Order of Hibernian members. So O'Brien is quite important, along with William Martin Murphy and the Independent, and along with Sinn Féin, in framing criticisms and framing perceptions of jobbery of Irish Parliamentary politicians being open to that, of them being backed by these kind of um, ruffians with hazel sticks like the Ancient Order of Hibernians, of the Ancient Order of Hibernians really being a complete block to any notion O'Brien might have had of conciliation. And indeed after 1918 as well, William O'Brien remains quite a prolific author and some of his publications there in many ways helped to frame uh, an early history of the Irish party through the lens of somebody who's significant in Parnell's leadership but who from, let's say, the 1910s is at odds with the main stem of the Irish Parliamentary Party. And he writes a lot of pieces, let's say, particularly in his book, The Irish Revolution, and how it came about, about the Irish Party, as he sometimes dubs it, the Hibernian Party. And he really frames these condemnations quite strongly. And this even has an impact then on those from a kind of a Redmondite background, or even a Dillonite background, if you look at the different stems of the Irish party, who are trying to get back involved in politics in the Free State in the 1920s, because O'Brien is adamant he doesn't want to see a revival of the Irish party in the 1920s. He develops something of an affinity for de Valera and for Fianna Fáil, and when there's a sign that the Irish National League is emerging in 1926, he writes letters to the newspaper. He's completely against any revival of the Irish Parliamentary Party, as he sees it, of the Irish National League. And so much so that uh, Fianna Fáil coming down in Cork actually invite him to stand for Fianna Fáil in the 1927 election. He turns it down because uh, he's quite advanced years at that point. But he plays a quite crucial role, both in terms of framing criticisms against the Irish party at its height, but also I think in terms of historicising the party after its defeat as well. Uh, the problem with the Irish party, I would have said, uh, is that they didn't have any centralised control over the propaganda that they were trying to put out uh, during the revolutionary era. They were inclined to leave it to each individual candidate rather than having a coherent um, you know, department of propaganda. And that's where Sinn Féin usurped them because they opened uh, Harcourt Street, which was the department of propaganda. They had a, a consolidated message that they wanted to get out. Um, they produced their own posters, which were distributed to the various different constituencies. Everything was stage managed um, by Sinn Féin and I'd have to say the same for unionists. Everything was stage managed by unionists as well. Yes, unionist associations selected their own candidates and things like that, but the message was central um, and it was clear what that message was. The Irish party were not as good as that. Um, so you got kind of a mishmash of messages. They were very, very good at it under Redmond because John Redmond kept control of the whole home rule message. But by the time you get into 1918 and certainly 
when they're defeated after 1918 and into the 1920s, it's really up to each individual candidate until politics changes again in the 1920s. So from what we've been talking about, we can see that in some ways, methods haven't changed that much in terms of getting the message out for elections. Do you think political parties today have, can learn any lessons from you know, the politicians of the past and how they go about getting their message out? If I can go to you first, Lillian. Uh, well, if I had my way, I would take the advertising departments of political parties and I would tell them to really look back on what was done uh, from 1918, really through the 1920s, because they knew how to run a political campaign. When we look around at our election posters, all you see are smiling faces of politicians and the party name. When you go back into 1980, even, even with the introduction of proportional representation, and now that changed uh, how messages were delivered uh, quite substantially, but people still had policy ideas in on their propaganda. So, um, you know, they would maybe give you the candidate name. There was no smiling face. The face of the candidate didn't matter. Um, the name mattered because you were using proportional representation and you had to go one, two, three, four. But uh, it was still the message. Um, and even when you go on up into the 1923 general election or the 1927 general election down south or the 1925 uh, election in Northern Ireland, you will see that it is the message that's far more important than the person. And that's something that we have changed quite radically um, in the modern era. Now we're looking at smiling faces. Yeah, well, I suppose a lot changes, but a lot doesn't necessarily change as well. I think something that if you look at, I suppose, the first couple of decades of the 20th century, I think the sense of pageantry and activism in politics is um, far more visible and far more central maybe in people's lives than it is nowadays. The sense to which people took part in politics, the sense to which people took part in politics even when they didn't necessarily have a vote in parliamentary elections until 1918 as well. I'm thinking, say, of the signing of the Ulster Solemn League and Covenant. I'm thinking of the kind of band culture around political meetings and the sense to which you even still have torchlit processions up into the middle part of the 20th century. These kind of things that crystallise particular moments, particular leaders and politi particular political parties in people's minds. And I think political parties could learn from that. A lot has changed, but trying to cap it's all about capturing people's imagination. But there's also then other things that are important too in terms of how they get candidates out there. And you mentioned the slogans, Elaine. I think people always associate maybe Sinn Féin and their early election victories with slogans like put him in to get him out. They, don't, they wouldn't necessarily think about a picture of Joseph McGuinness or Count Plunkett. They'd think of these kind of slogans as well. And particularly around the time of 1918 and 1920, where you have things like a greatly extended franchise that brings women onto the electoral register for parliamentary elections, and indeed then you have the coming of proportional representation with 1920. A lot of election propaganda there is actually appealing to new voters and making sure people vote properly and making sure people understand how a system like PRSTV works as opposed to a first-past-the-post system. So it still matters that a party has a label and has a brand recognition and personality is important in the same way that a name would have been important before party labels were put on ballot papers. But there's a lot to be learned too, I think, in terms of content as well as just simply a symbol, although symbols are important, but also engaging people in politics. And it might be that torchlit processions are not going to engage people in politics nowadays, but I think politicians are always searching for the next big thing, trying to get ahead of the message and tapping into this kind of um, population zeitgeist, if you like. The reason put them in to get them out works is people it's stuck in people's minds. And sometimes the Irish Parliamentary Party were guilty of reacting to things when it comes to the period 1918, 1920. So for example, they hadn't really cultivated women's activists for that, up to that point. And then you have, then say the Internet of Hibernians printing these leaflets and talking about the importance of women voting and, and really promoting their ladies' auxiliary. Whereas, say, the Ulster Unionist Women's Council was stronger before that, Sinn Féin had been stronger at integrating women. So it's trying to get ahead of the message, if you like, I think, as well. I think that's what political parties want to do. And I think that's where they can look at what was novel in 1910 or novel in 1920. What was new? And do something that separates them from their competitors. Okay. Elaine, Martin, thanks very much. That was thanks a very, very interesting conversation. Thank you. Thank you.